Now there's a lovely scene. First thing Sunday morning, mid-October, South Florida, a bunch of folks getting together to play a friendly game of croquet. Or three guys using this as an excuse to spend time with Sandy Canoe. But wait a minute. These four players have 33 national championships among them. These players are all good friends, but this is not a friendly game. This is the doubles final of the USCA National Championships in American Rules Croquet. It's being held again in October 2021 at the National Croquet Center in West Palm Beach, Florida. These two teams met earlier in the tournament and Morgan and Essex won. So this is a grudge match. Stephen Morgan's playing red, handicap of minus three. Thirty-two of those national championships were in championship flight by the men in the group. Sandy has won. Hers was in first flight in American rules, but it was a national championship. When you're playing Sharif, as far away as you can get from hoop two is a good place to be in the beginning. Sandy's partner is Sharif Abdelwahab, who was inducted into the Croquet Hall of Fame last weekend. I'm doing this in February. And last but not least is Matthew Essex, the youngest of the group, who has a handicap of minus three and a half, playing yellow. We've gone on about Matthew in other videos, and everybody knows about him anyway. His most sterling accomplishment, to date anyway, is probably finishing second to Reg Bamford in the World Championships in AC a couple of years ago. Watching Steven's hand gestures, I think he's planning an attack already. It looks like Sharif initially considered a wide join, but then had Sandy give him a rush to his hoop, which would seem safe because the balls are paired up as far apart as they can get. The only caveat is that all four balls are for hoop two. In their doubles game with Van Tassel and Scalpone, I labeled Sharif an outgame predator. In this game, we got nothing but apex predators. At this level, as good as these folks are, it's eat or be eaten. Nice shot. Wasn't we lucky? That was <laughs> lucky or good. The two seem to go hand in hand. Good 
Great shot. The purpose of Red's tack, of course, was to give Yellow a three ball break. But with Blue landing right next to Yellow like that, it's going to be tough to get going. Steven would have to wire Red from Black behind hoop two, and it's just a bit risky for this early in the morning. Standard deadness board with the addition of a Second column showing clip position. Because those balls are so close together, this is not a double target. A double target is three balls wide. And he just barely missed. This thing is so loud. Yeah, I had fun. I had a great time. Yeah. I'll be down there. I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going to Jones. Be safe. I'll see you later. Bye. That's not so important. Yeah, but. Oh, you know what, actually? You could give me a line rush and then be uh, at my Pioneer Wire. I like it. You see it? No. I can shoot it black. I like it. I like it.
because yellow is dead on partner and on blue, black has deadness rotation. He has a bunch of options. These guys are all adept at running two ball breaks. He could just two ball around and pick those balls up out of corner one when he got there. Or he could set up probably a rush to the attack after he makes two. He obviously meant for blue to get a lot closer to red and yellow, but this can hardly be classified as a mistake because yellow, which plays next, is only live on black, and it's a long way away. Apex predator indeed. As handicaps get lower in this game, the strategy has to change. When the handicap's minus one or zero, one can frequently just play well and hope that the opponent makes a mistake. Get down to minus three, minus three and a half. You can't rely on the opponent to make a mistake, so you have to attack early. Matthew uses an upright stop or drive shot to get in front of every odd-numbered hoop, and it's one of the keys to running a two-ball break. Almost every one of these hoop approaches is a version of load and hold. And that dolly rush to the next hoop is the goal of that technique. Plan to make the hoop and go to me? Yes. Okay. Which side are you two going to be on? Um, you want it on that side? I feel like these are the same. Okay, so on that side. Where do you want black? You want it more towards you? Makes it easier shot. Yeah. Okay. Somehow, I think his standards are higher than mine are. Blue is the spent ball, so Stephen could set the leaf for <coughs> yellow here. But then he'd have to go deal with black between four and five anyway, so he might as well just 
run the break, leave blue where it is, and then park yellow beside it when he finishes his break. With no two-back Pioneer, Yellow's in perfect position as the one-back Pioneer.
He didn't hit either upright. Only in American rules do you get penalized for that. Putting yellow in corner two near blue's hoop may seem less than obvious, but blue has a rush to nowhere and black has a rush to corner four. Three is black's hoop, so putting yellow any place but corner two would make it vulnerable to an attack by black. We're going to play that shot again because it's a good opportunity for a rules discussion. When somebody puts a ball so far out of bounds that they have to pack a lunch to go get it, it brings up the issue of clock management. Matthew's turn ends when that yellow ball crosses the boundary. Sandy's turn, playing blue, starts when Matthew's turn ends. Only the striker can call a timeout, but until the last 15 minutes of the game, you're not allowed to call a timeout just for ball retrieval. So if she wanted to stop the game clock because she's behind, she would have to use a personal timeout to do it. That, of course, makes no sense this early in the game, so she just goes ahead and passes while that ball is being retrieved. And ordinarily, Steven's turn playing red would start as soon as she passed. I mean, he went to get the ball and now uh, you have 45 seconds. But as Sharif points out, Steven doesn't lose any of his 45 seconds because his turn actually doesn't really start until the shot clock is reset when yellow gets marked back in. Of course, in the last 15 minutes, the striker during ball retrieval can use the rule posted above Matthew's head to their advantage to either get an extra timeout or let the clock run. But the essence in this case is that Matthew's team didn't have to use any of their 45 seconds or burn a personal timeout for ball retrieval. Red is for three back, yellow is for five, so a nice wide join up here by their hoops to discourage black from attacking. Black 
black hats played? Uh, yeah. Pass. Blue passes. Game over? <laughs> uh, not yet. Our AC players will know there are rules for impasses in AC, but in American rules, you don't need them because there's a time limit. Sure. You can't stand off when there's one thing in the league. Sometimes you just get tired of passing. But this time he's going to wait for Stevie to get to corner two to catch this rocket. They are doing whatever they can to keep Sharif from getting a break going. That's Paul Bennett live streaming this game. I'm not sure what platform he was using, but I do know that Ben Rothman was watching in California up early for this event.
time-honored principle, attack before you make your hoop, or you may not get to make the attack. Okay, don't look in your rule book. Decide now what you would do if you're another player a board keeper or a referee or a spectator. And here's the answer, rule 1.2, clips. A player, referee, or a board keeper is obliged to call attention to a misplaced clip as soon as they see it. Knowledgeable spectators can get involved but should do it through an official just to make sure they're not giving inappropriate advice. Brian Hovis, your videographer, is a knowledgeable spectator, and he said to a Class 1 referee sitting next to him, look, Matthew just put his clip on the wrong hoop. And the response was, you're right, but we can't say anything. If your opponent is about to make any of the three following mistakes, you are not obliged to forestall. The rules do not force you to help your opponent. I think a lot of folks lump in this business about misplaced clip with that list inappropriately because it feels like the rules are making you help your opponent. However, not only is that in violation of Rule 1.2 about clip placement, it's also in violation of the intervention rule. This is not a courtesy. You are required to correct improper clip placement and a wrong deadness board as soon as you notice it. As you will see in a few minutes, that understanding is not universal. And because of this incident, that first paragraph is being modified by the Rules Committee to make sure it's clear that not just a referee, but the players are required to intervene in the appropriate circumstance. Sorry to go on so long about this, but as you will see in a few minutes, the obligation to correct misinformation immediately needs considerable clarification at all levels of our game. 
she's right, right on the line. Well. And she's good enough for it to make a difference. And now Steven starts the break that Matthew laid for him. Ordinarily, Steven would be planning how to go get blue about now, but yellow's dead on blue, so he doesn't have to bother. And of course, Stephen doesn't know that the yellow clip belongs on two bag, not three bag.
There must be something toxic coming in on the breeze here because the shooting is going to get really ragged for the next few minutes. Much choice where I can go. Four and three, I believe. Okay, that sounds great. Told you she was good. A good rush to his hoop from 130 feet away. Give me a break. He has never missed two four yarders in a row against me. Matt, is that your hoop? Yeah. It is, yeah. No, you did not do two back. Yeah, it is. Ooh, no, maybe it did. you did not. I did not make two back. You're correct. You're correct. So Sharif correctly intervenes when Matthew is about to take an unearned continuation shot. Uh, uh, hit, hit that red. Hit that red. The issue, of course, is when did Sharif notice the misplaced clip? A lot of old-time high-level players don't even use the deadness board or the clips. They just keep it all in their head. But Sharif did acknowledge that he had noticed the misplaced clip earlier. 
got it. But he was interpreting the intervention rule as not requiring him to help his opponent, which is exactly how that class one referee that Brian talked to when the clip was first place interpreted the rule. The chatter in the background about this is akin to the parable of the blind men and the elephant. Hopefully the change is going into the rule book and maybe even this video a little bit will make it abundantly clear to everybody that one is obliged to correct a wrong board or clip misplacement immediately. Are you obligated? Can you place your clip tree? Sorry? Can you place your clip tree? Oh. I'm not sure where to put it. I think it's fine. If it wasn't fine, I would let you know. So blue and black are down 5 to 18. If Sharif goes to peg off this break that Sandy laid for him, it's only five hoops difference, and Sandy just has to make a six ball break to win the game. He's already planning to leave. Since Blue's opponent did, he's going to have to leave her either in front of her hoop or with a decent rush on black to her hoop. Red and yellow have lots of deadness, but they're going to get a clearance. How much about 25 minutes. It's complicated, but there's plenty of time. Going after red now may seem like a bit of a stretch, but it's the ball Blue's going to need after she makes hoop two to start her break. And he's got a great pioneer at one back, so now's the time for somebody who has all these shots. Of course, yeah, he could say he didn't know, but he knew there was time. Yeah. And even if someone did break that rule, there was there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, it's more of a sport. 
Not all of us have that shot. Well, if he did, he didn't say anything about it. But he knew. Well, how do you know he knew? Because of the way he said it, as soon as the triple play. Are you disputing that he didn't know? I'm saying Hutchinson. There's always. Well, that's what you're saying. No, I'm saying he said it as soon as the. As if, yeah, I mean. He's setting up Red to peel it through Rover and then peg it out. He would much rather do that to Yellow so there's nobody to take the long shot when he does the leave for Blue. And taking Red out of the game makes it harder for Blue to go around and win the game in one break. But I think there's enough time that he figures they'll be able to do it a hoop or two at a time. Our international AC audience will recognize the setup for the penult peel and a triple using the death roll to an excellent pioneer at four back. And he got it. Uh, 
widescreen format. So when you hit Ugh. I wanted to see how he was going to finish it. Not what he wanted. He did make a net five hoops, but his partner did. Yellow takes the one back clearance and should probably be able to get going. Oh, you noticed right away. Yellow got the clearance. Yellow got the clearance. Oh, yellow served the ball. No, he, he took the one back there. Yeah. yeah. What? I should have told you. Should have or should not have? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you. Oh, you guys can just. Uh, well, we'll read the rule later. I don't know. I think it's something like the, when you see, when you immediately saw us place the tip of the wrong spot. <laughs> Oh, 
how much time. One minute takes really a time. It looks like you. We'll check it after. It's my, it's my mistake. And if Sharif hadn't already peeled red through Rover for him, Matthew probably would have played a little harder for the reverse rush on red back that way now. Which is plenty of time. It's plenty of time, right? And they're, uh, they're not allowing it to You should be allowed to Yeah. Because there is some time. Matthew Essek and Stephen Morgan, 26-11 over Sandy Knuth and Sharif Abdelwahab to become the 
2021 USCA doubles national champions. Yeah. 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 